know um, our oldest, Liam, he's turned five, he's at school now, so we're trying to have Danielle and the kids travel a little less so that Liam's fairly stable in school um, and just means that, sorry, you get just me today. Um, so I apologise for that because I know I'm, I'm the least of, uh, of the bunch, but on behalf of, of Danielle um, and our family, I just want to say thank you so much to all of you guys for um, your support for us, your prayer for us, your care for us, and uh, we, like you guys are a super important part of what we do as we um, seek to reach young people in the South Island with the gospel. So thank you for, for being a part of that and supporting us in that. But we find ourselves at Christmas time. And, you know, we, um, once a year we do this. It's kind of this annual thing. And we find ourselves celebrating with family and with food, with Santa, with presents. But how often do we take time to take a step back from the tradition and from the things that we're used to doing with our families and take time to consider the real historical events that are leading us to this, have this celebration? How often do we take a step back from the children's stories that, that we read for our kids with the nativity in it and go, what does the Bible actually tell us about this period in history. Christmas centers around the birth of of one man, a very real, historical man who actually lived, Jesus of Nazareth. And I want to take us to 1 Timothy 1, verse 15, as we start, because I think Paul, as he's writing to his young protege, Timothy, really sums this up well. He says, here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. So Paul is telling Timothy how thankful he is that Christ has saved him in spite of his sin. And I think what Paul's given us there is just a great summary But two really important questions arise out of it, which we're going to tackle today. One is, who is this Christ Jesus that Paul talks about? And how could he save sinners? So who is Christ Jesus? I think we need to go back to the beginning of of Jesus' life to answer that. In Luke chapter 2, verse 11, we have this announcement of the birth. It says, Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. The Messiah. We have these kind of weird words which are ascribed to Jesus. And I just want to clear up any confusion that there might be about them. Messiah comes from the Hebrew Mashiach, and we just transliterate it into English, Messiah. It means the anointed one. We have the same word in Greek, Christos, which we transliterate into English as Christ. So Messiah and Christ both mean the anointed one. They are the same word, just from two different languages. And they're not a name, they're a title. Jesus Christ just kind of rolls off our tongue, almost like that's his last name, like Jesus is the son of Mary and Joseph Christ, but he's not. (laughs) It's a title, meaning anointed one. And you may recall that when Samuel went and selected David to be the next king of Israel, he anointed him with oil. It was something that was done for a king. So we have this announcement that Jesus has just been born in the town of Bethlehem. The town of Bethlehem was the the hometown of King David, and so it became known as the town of David. And this is just 10 kilometers south of the capital city of Jerusalem. In fact, it's so close to Jerusalem that today, it's basically just a suburb of the greater city of, of Jerusalem. And we have these angels. This verse is spoken by angels. And they appear to shepherds in the fields nearby and announce the birth of the long 
expected, the long anticipated Messiah. Now, to understand who this Messiah is, why he's been anticipated and expected for so long, we need to journey back through the Old Testament. And I want to take you to Genesis. Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. This verse is God speaking to the serpent just after he has tempted Eve and both Adam and Eve have eaten the forbidden fruit. Sin has entered the world and God says this to the serpent. He says, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. This little passage is sometimes called the Proto-Evangelium, the first gospel, the first good news. And this is what God is saying as sin has just entered the world, as the human race has fallen from their relationship with God. This is one of the first things God says. He says, I am going to deal with the problem of sin. Right from the outset, God promises that the serpent will be crushed. And he will be crushed by an offspring of Eve, a descendant of Eve. That means that God is going to use a human to deal with the problem of sin. And throughout the Old Testament, we learn more and more about who this one who will deal with the problem of sin is going to be. We get more and more information. If we go to Daniel chapter 9, we actually get the when. Chapter 9, verse 25 of Daniel. Daniel is told this. Know and understand this. From the time the word goes out to restore and rebuild Jerusalem... Until the anointed one, the ruler comes, there will be seven sevens and sixty-two sevens. So Daniel is a prophet, and he's not in Israel, he's in Babylon. And around about 586 BC, King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon came into Israel, he defeated them, he took tons of people from Israel to Babylon, into captivity. The temple was destroyed. Jerusalem was in ruins. And so God's people, Israel, are now in captivity in Babylon. And Daniel gets told that from the time the word goes out to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until the anointed one, the Messiah, the Christ, the one who will deal with sin, until he comes, there'll be... Seven sevens and 62 sevens. And these these sevens are just groups of years. So if you do the math, it works out to 483 prophetic years. The Jews dealt in prophetic years of 360 days. So you do the math again, approximately 476 calendar years. They They have a date. Because we know from Nehemiah that the proclamation to rebuild and restore Jerusalem happened in 444 BC. Which means that as we get into the first century AD, the Jewish people know that they are in the generation in which Messiah will come. The Jewish people are under the oppression of Rome. They're not free. They're not their own nation anymore. They're subjugated by the Roman Empire. And it's a harsh life to live. And so the Jewish people know they're coming into the generation when the Messiah will come. The one who's going to deal with sin is going to come. And they're holding their collective breath, waiting for the Messiah. And not only was there great expectation around the time, but they also knew the place. And thanks, Janine, for reading out Micah 5 too, because that tells us, But you, Bethlehem Ephratah, though you are among 
though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from old, from ancient times. So they know that they're in the generation that the Messiah will come, and they know that Messiah is going to come from Bethlehem. What a time to live. All Scripture has been building to this point. And Israel has been chosen as the nation through which Messiah will come. And that's who Jesus is. He is the promised one who will deal with the problem of sin. That's been anticipated for thousands of years. But how could he save sinners if he's a man? Well, Jesus is no ordinary man. And we often refer to Jesus as the Son of God. And when you and I hear Son of, we think lesser than, subordinate to, younger than. But that's our Western ear hearing that. When a Jewish ear hears that, they hear something quite different. You see, in, in the Jewish culture, you didn't become a son until you were 12 or 13 years of age, and you went through your bar mitzvah, your coming of age ceremony. That's when you would become a son, you would become a man, and you would become an heir, and you would become equal with your father. So, say for example, if I was Jewish and I had three male children, 15 years old, 11 years old, 7 years old, then I would have one son and two boys. One son, because he's 15 years old, he's come of age, he is an heir and is seen as my equal, and two boys, because they're 11, they're 7, they're not yet come of age. So when a Jewish heir hears son of God, they hear God himself. And Philippians chapter 2, verses 6 through 8, gives us a great insight into Jesus, the God-man. It says about Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. The Creator stepped into time to save his rebellious, created, sinful image bearers, you and me. His death on a cross outside Jerusalem, not quite 2,000 years ago, paid the penalty for sin. He is perfect and so had no sin of his own to pay for. He is infinite and so his death could pay for infinite sin. He is God. And so the grave could not hold him. He rose from the dead. So when you place your faith in Jesus to save you from your sin, you place your faith in a very real man who is also God. Jesus of Nazareth, the son of a carpenter, who was born... He lived, he grew, he learned, he matured, he died, he rose again, and he will return. (coughs) The coming of the Savior was an earth-shattering event. It was an event that 
the world had been anticipating for thousands of years. And it's an event that has ripples throughout time. It's an event that has changed our world. Because now, sinful human beings can come into a relationship with their creator God. The coming of the Savior was this earth-shattering event, (coughs) but it was carried out in such quiet humility. We have these pictures and these things built up in our minds of, of how this happened. The birth of Jesus. You know, our, our kids' storybooks will tell us that Mary and Joseph had to go down to Bethlehem for a census. And so nine months pregnant, they, they head on down. And when they get there, the town is full to bursting because of all the people there for the census and all the hotels and the motels and even the inns are just full up with people. There's nowhere for them to stay. But one innkeeper takes pity on them, says, okay, I've got a stable out the back. You can go, go stay there. It'll be, be better than you know, having the baby born in the streets. And as soon as they get there, man, Jesus is born laid in this kind of cozy wooden manger with straw in it. That sound familiar? You know the Bible doesn't actually tell us any of that? It's really interesting. Because as, as we look at what information we have in the Bible and as we look at Jewish culture, I think we can construct quite a different view of what really happened. And I, I honestly believe that it makes it more amazing because it's more humble in reality. See, this would have been a really difficult time for Mary and Joseph. Mary's pregnant. They're not married. In that culture, that did not happen. They would have been social outcasts in Nazareth, where they lived. Joseph is from Bethlehem. He's he's got to go down to Bethlehem at some point anyway, because he does have to register for the census. But it's not on a specific day. It'll be over a period of months, just sometime in that that period, get there. And Mary didn't have to go. It was just Joseph that would have had to go and register. So the fact that Mary is going is probably indicative that they weren't just going down to register for a census, but they had decided to up and leave their lives in Nazareth and move to Bethlehem. Because life would have probably become really, really difficult for them in that town. They get to Bethlehem, and in Jewish culture, and in in that time, There was no such thing as inns in the towns. They just didn't exist. In Jewish culture, it would have been unthinkable for Joseph to do anything but go to his family. So they would have gone to Joseph's family in Bethlehem. And they would have looked at Mary and looked at Joseph and said, Guys, this is really difficult for us. We haven't, we haven't been to a wedding. What's going on? In fact, the word that is translated in, in the nativity story, is used one other place in the Gospels. In that instance, it's translated upper room. And it's referring to the Last Supper where Jesus met with his disciples in the upper room of a private house and shared that final meal together before Jesus went to the cross. 
the kataluma, which is the, that word, the upper room, was a place on the roof of a Jewish house where they would put their guests. It was a place of honor. And so when Mary and Joseph get to Bethlehem, the answer they're given is not, oh, now nah, this is full, there's no room for you in the inn. The answer they're given is there is no place for you in the upper room, in the guest house. That's no place for you. We cannot look after you there. And it's likely that they said, but okay, you guys are family. Use the stable. You can stay in the stable. Mary wouldn't have been nine months pregnant at this time. There's no way that a lady in that condition would have made the arduous journey over mountain ranges to get from Nazareth down to Bethlehem. So they're there for some time before Jesus is born. And the stable that they would have stayed in wasn't a nice wooden edifice, as we would think of a stable. They didn't do a lot of building with wood in Israel. They did their building with stone. And what they would normally do was they would quarry out of a cliff face or a hillside the stone to build the house, but they would make sure that they quarried it in such a way that what they left behind was a cave, and that cave was a place that they would use to shelter animals. So Mary and Joseph end up staying in, most likely, a cave. And that is where the Savior of the world is born. The manger, just a feeding trough for animals, would have just been a leftover block of stone that had been hollowed out to just throw some feed in for the animals. These are the circumstances into which Jesus is born. This humility, this shame, not because there was any real shame to be had because Mary was a virgin, but the shame that surrounded them simply by by the interpretation of the people in their lives. The birth of the Messiah was of huge significance to the whole planet. And yet it happens in these quiet, humble, shameful circumstances. Let's return to the announcement of Messiah's birth in Luke chapter 2, verse 11. Today, in the town of Bethlehem, sorry, in the the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This is angels announcing the birth to, not to King Herod, 10 kilometers up the road, not to the mayor of Bethlehem, not even to the wealthy merchants and and businessmen and, and the people of influence in the town. The angels go out to the fields, to the lowliest people, the shepherds. Have you ever asked yourself, why did they tell the shepherds? And I said, Bethlehem is only 10 kilometers from Jerusalem. It's really close. And Jerusalem is the temple. And when you think of the temple, it's, it's not a church. It's a slaughterhouse where animals are sacrificed daily for the sin of the Jewish people. And the fields around Bethlehem are the place where the lambs were raised and tended that would then be sold and sent to the temple to be sacrificed. So the angels come to the shepherds who tend the sacrificial lambs and say to them, Come, come and meet the Lamb of God. Come and meet the Lamb of God who will take away the sin of the world. Come and see the baby whose blood will be the last sacrifice, the ultimate sacrifice. 
for the sin of mankind. The coming of the Savior was this earth shattering, changing, tumultuous event. But it was carried out in such quiet humility. This Christmas, as you celebrate with friends, with family, with presents, with food, Take time to contemplate the wonder of God, the second member of the Trinity, stepping into this world, humbling himself to be born as a baby. Don't worry so much about whether your kids believe in the the red fellow. Worry about whether or not they believe in the Savior. The Savior is the reason that we celebrate this season. Christ Jesus came to this earth with a purpose. And his purpose was to save sinners. To restore that broken relationship between mankind and God. And maybe you're sitting here today and you don't know if your relationship with God has been restored. Maybe some of the things that you're hearing this morning, it's the first time you've heard them. If that's you, then I just want to say it's such a simple thing. If you want to be saved from your sin, if you want to live a life that is in relationship with the God who created you, then all you need to do is believe that Jesus of Nazareth, this man that we've been talking about, is also God, who died on the cross for your sin and rose from the dead. And if you believe that and you trust in him and him alone to save you from your sin, then you are restored to relationship with your Creator. And Christ has fulfilled His purpose in coming to this earth in your life. Let's pray together. Well, Jesus, it's kind of crazy to contemplate just how humble the circumstances of your arrival into this world were. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you willingly humbled yourself to be born as a baby. And not not just any baby, but to be born in the lowliest of circumstances. We thank you for the life you lived. We thank you for the death that you died for us on our behalf. And we thank you that you rose again. And we thank you that now you are seated at the right hand of God the Father in the place of honor. And Lord, we look forward to your return. Thank you for your love, your grace, your mercy. And I pray that in this season, you would help us each to just reflect upon the wonder of your birth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.